Hey guys, Lucas from Explore here. Today we're exploring Kanda, which is this area where we are. And we're starting in the train station because there's some cool shots I want to shoot here. All right, now, this video is sponsored by iExplore itself because we have a map of Tokyo photo spots that we're happy to share with you guys. And you can book one of our workshops on our website, so please check that out. I explore. So the thing I really want to shoot is this neon sign. Let's shoot it. Let's go a little farther. It's like I said there. I wanted to shoot it face on, but I'll shoot it from an angle. That looks really good too. Alright, so maybe from about here. Let me a little closer. But basically, I love this neon sign. This is an epic, epic neon sign here in Tokyo. The neon is gradually going away. There's a couple other really awesome neon signs that don't exist anymore, sadly. Um, in fact, recently there was one right by where I live that disappeared and I was really sad about that. It kind of happened out of nowhere. Um, and over the years I've seen other really cool neon signs disappear. And, and so this is one that I think is one of the, you know, the great ones in Tokyo. You kind of, you've seen, you've seen a lot of people take photos of it. It's not, you know, it's pretty iconic. And yeah, I don't know how much longer it's going to exist. So even though I have some great photos of it already, I thought since we're going to shoot in Kanda today, might as well shoot this neon sign a little bit. Now I'm going to wait for the train to come into frame. I want like the train and the sign in the same time. We'll see how that turns out. Of course, I'm shooting on a very slow shutter. I'm only on a 20th of a second. F4 in this case. Oh, here it comes. Nice. And then I also like to shoot through the train, which we'll do in a minute from the front, or from the side, I should say, like front on of the sign. But that turned out pretty cool. Very nice. What I like doing, why I like in particular these trains on a slow shutter, is they have this LED sign on the front and on the sides too. These LEDs flicker at whatever refresh rate over here. And when they do, they leave a really cool effect when you use a slow shutter. All right, so now that the people have gone, we can shoot it straight from the side. And then when the train comes in, I'll be able to shoot through the train and get a really cool effect. So this is a great scene right now, that lady on there. Did I get that before the doors closed? Ah, just barely. Okay, let's see here. All right, beautiful. Just a clean front on shot of the sign. And then, you know, I'm gonna wait for another train and I have the sign already in focus because I'm using back button focus. But I could also just switch to manual, focused on it. When the train comes, I'm not going to focus again. It'll just go by and I'll have this beautiful blurred shot of the train blurry with the sign kind of semi-visible through the windows. That's, that's my concept. It, it'll look better if there's actually fewer people on the train because if the train's totally packed, you can't actually see through it anymore. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. I've done this before. I've tried it a few times. It turned out good, but always can have more photos of something really cool like this and also you know for the sake of the video here I think it's a nice way to illustrate some motion blur techniques all right now he's got to be patient for the train the rapid train will arrive shortly on track six please stand behind the yellow line All right, so yeah, it turned out pretty cool. I mean, it's not perfect. Like I said, you can only see some of the the neon through. Oh, there's a, I got one at least where you can. It's actually like very well framed because there's some luck involved with the timing of the window in front, right? So in this case, this is one of the few times I use the high speed mode on this camera, which shoots 20 frames a second, which is pretty crazy. All right, I got the shot. Let's get out of this noisy train station. All right, 
So let's let's come out here somewhere. I like this team, these guys. Ah, kind of missed it though. Wow, they're really in a hurry. Ah, got a quick shot. Don't need the uh, high-speed mode anymore. No need to shoot so many frames a second for most cases. But anyway, now that we're out on the quiet streets, we can talk a bit more. I thought it'd be fun to start in the platform there, on the, on, in the station on the platform. But beyond just doing some street photography and exploring Kanda a little bit, which we promised to do a while back when we did a video walking here from Akihabara. So this is maybe the sequel to that video. But um, I also want to talk a little bit about my kind of six month, well, actually more like eight month impression of the Z9. So we're not gonna, I'm not gonna like stand here and just talk about the camera, but as we go along, I'll mention a few things about it that, you know, I had a very good impression of it right when I got it, but it's been solidified over the last eight months. Let's put it that way. Let me get a shot of these guys here. It's a cool scene. Anyway, cool. So yeah, first things first, I mean, the thing that has impressed me and I was just utilizing it right now is the, the stabilization. It's very, very good. I mean, it was great on the Z6 already, but it continues to you know, amaze me how well this cameras can stabilize things because I use very slow shutters often in my work and it makes it a lot easier. I don't have to lug around a tripod and do that kind of stuff. Um, but other things as well that were, you know, that were already good, but not only did I realize how good they are over time, but also they've improved thanks to firmware updates. And that is the tracking autofocus. I mean, it's really, really incredible in this camera. The uh, like face tracking, eye tracking, whatever, whether you're doing video or photo, I find it's just absolutely amazing for me. Like it's always locked right on to the, the eyes and you can like flip between the, you know, different subjects if you want to switch from this person's face to that person's face. It's crazy. Honestly, I don't need this half the time, but <laughs> it's just really nice to have. It's one of those really nice to have things. Um, but yeah, but I think the ultimately the most kind of, I don't want to say impressive. Oh, this is a nice street. We're going to go in this dark little passage here. You know, but having said all that, I think the, the thing that has mostly impacted me or impressed me, and now that I'm used to it, I can't go back, is the lack of a physical shutter and the fact that this is purely an electronic shutter and that there's no blackout or sounds or anything like that. I really enjoy that. It just makes the photography feel very seamless, you know, like it's just, I don't know, there's just no interruption between me and the scene, which is ironic because when I was shooting on, when I had an SLR, I mean, still have it, but you know, when I was predominantly shooting on SLRs and um, I was kind of reluctant to go to mirrorless, it was because there was this, um, you know, perceived thing between me and the subject, right? Whatever it is that I might be shooting, right? There's this the screen in here, so I'm not seeing the real life the way I would with, um, you know, with an, an optical viewfinder on an SLR, right? But when you shoot with an SLR, of course, you have the mirror going up and down, and there is this blackout. I mean, it happens, right? And you kind of get used to it. You don't think about it when you're shooting on SLRs for years and years and years. But now that you got used to this, going back to having the shutter blackout is like extremely annoying. Like, I've tried it on some other cameras, and I, f I find it's a little frustrating, and I wish it didn't happen. So it's something that I've really, really gotten used to here. All right, let me get maybe one more shot of this, then we'll keep going. Actually, yeah. Wait, does this light turn back on? There was a light here. Oh, okay, this light was on and then it turned off because I wanted to shoot that scene. But oh, there we go. There we go. Axel turned it on for me. Nice. Okay, great. Yeah, I really like these pipes and stuff here, but only when they're lit by this light. Yeah, and actually this is a very high frequency LED light. And just for the sake of, of kind of experimentation, what would happen if I shot this at a fast shutter speed like 250? Do I get any kind of weird banding? Not that I can tell. And so that's the other thing is I was very worried, not very worried, but let's keep going, but concerned that there would be some kind of artifacts or banding or weird colors from the electrical or electronic shutter, right? That the fact that I don't have a mechanical one would, would cause these issues. And it, and it does cause issues, like if you use an electronic shutter on, say, the Z6, it will have flickering, right? But they did some magic in this thing, I guess, that it reads out fast enough that it just doesn't do that. And I encountered issues with this in one single location. It was like a restaurant lit with all these LED lights, and I had some problems there. But I haven't had problems since. 
and whew, shoot these guys maybe over here. I wonder if it's the same guys from before. And I've even shot a couple of events, you know, business events and things like that. And those were lit, you know, those are indoors, lit with all kinds of artificial lighting, whether it's fluorescent or, whew, that's noisy. Whether it's fluorescent or LEDs or whatever, and I never encountered this issue ever again. And on top of that, with firmware updates, they've added this thing where you can like fine tune the shutter speed to like extremely precise numbers, like, like one over 63.7 or something like that. And then apparently you can, find like a shutter speed that syncs up with all the high intensity LEDs or whatever. Never had to use this feature, but it's there. All right, let's see. We're not gonna go that way because it's just gonna get darker. Let's go on this little side street here. It's kind of cool. Actually, I love this retro building on the side here. That's a really cool scene, beautiful. Beautifully lit. Okay, hopefully. Okay, good, there you are. I was worried you're gonna get run over. <laughs> I love it. Such a cool scene. Yeah, and you see like the Ibis, I mean, I've already, you know, the Z6 and Z7 have really good Ibis too. I don't know if this is particularly better, but I'm very confident to just like get it down to a tenth and therefore keep my ISO nice and low, 280, even though the fact that the camera can handle like really high ISO super well, so I don't need to get it that low, but it's just like a nice thing to have. Wow, these guys are in such a hurry delivering all this booze. <laughs> yeah, let me get one shot here, a nice slow one. And then I'm going to prepare for these guys. I assume they're going to be running back. So we'll do this on a nice fast shutter speed. 500th of a second, f2.8. And we'll wait for them. They might be back in a second. And then we'll get them running down the street. Maybe. We'll see. But yeah, and then having said that about jobs, you know, like there was a day over the last few months where I had actually two jobs in a row. I had to shoot um, an event, right? It was like six hours long. And then right after that, I had to go across town to Shibuya and I shot portraits of a, of a guy, right? A, a man who hired me to get some nice portraits of him in the city. So it was like nine hours of shooting. I shot like 3,000 photos that day, like a thousand of the dude, two thousands of the event. And I was actually kind of worried. Like my battery was full in the morning, but then I had to, I was messing with some settings and stuff on the way to the thing and it was like 95% by the time the job started I was kind of like oh no I should have brought the charger and I had an extra battery and just just in case here we go oh no there's too many other people okay well that ended up kind of messy and this guy was cool and then yeah speaking of AF wow that was a nice showcase of the AF system because out of like six, seven shots I took, only one was out of focus. And there was like other people in the scene and it's dark, backlit. And that's what I'm talking about. This thing, it's just ridiculously good. So yeah, so the battery ended up lasting that, that day, all day. 3,000 photos, I had like 8% left at the end of the day. I didn't even get into the spare battery. That blew my mind. I didn't think it was gonna do that well. I never pushed it like that far and shot that many photos and spent that much time. And you know, I was shooting for six hours and like, it wasn't non-stop uh, during the event, but it was like a lot. It was like, you know, four or five hours of shooting, maybe. Maybe, let's say four. I think there was like two hours total of not shooting time. And when I say shooting, I don't mean like holding the button down. I just mean the camera's on and I'm thinking about what to shoot. And I'm, you know, sometimes looking through the viewfinder, sometimes clicking the shutter, sometimes not. That's what I mean by shooting. So, yeah. Four hours of that at the event, plus another couple of hours, two hours with the, with the gentleman who hired me. One battery. Amazing. Anyway, let's keep going. I paused back there thinking something might be cool, but we'll head back over towards the station. That's kind of where Kanda is the most lively. But anyway, um, yeah, what else can I say after kind of like a six month impression? Like I said, I'm very satisfied with this camera. Don't regret buying it at all. It's totally, totally worth it. There's a car trying to run us over. <laughs> he had, okay, he's just stopping over there. Yeah, wow, look at this uh, badass car over here. I like it. So see, we're gonna go to F2, minus 1.0. Just shoot this custom, custom car with the wing and stuff. Get out of the way of that car. Eh, it's a little overexposed, but nah, it's okay. Nope, not worth going back. It's not that important of a shot. Um, and yeah, as I'm switching modes, that reminds me, something that, you know, was the only thing that annoyed me about the camera 
and, and also the Z6, whatever, just since I've switched away from the, uh, the SLRs to Nikon's mirrorless is that, you know, on the Z6 there's a mode dial, and on this one there's a mode button, and it's on the left side here. But on the, on the D4, I had a mode button on the right side, which I really liked using. And in the last firmware update, they made it so this ISO button that's up here is not customizable, and it can function as the mode button, which I absolutely love. <laughs> That alone is worth having this camera for me in terms of a mirrorless camera that has this thing. It's such a little thing, but it just, it's a little quality of experience. You know, it, it improves the quality of my experience, basically. I don't have to, you know, I can do everything with one hand. I can just switch modes, which is what I did for shooting that car. I was on aperture mode because maybe there's a street photo, street moment, so I want to be in fast mode. But then the car's not moving, it's very dark. So I wanted to slow down the shutter. Let's go this way. Slow it down to a 20th, right? So for that, I got to switch modes to manual mode and I could do it right here with the holding the ISO button and flicking that. And that is awesome, just flicking the dial there. Um, which kind of, I, can, I guess I can summarize this whole camera, my whole impression of it, is that when I was, ooh, wait, here's a cool scene. I'll get to my summary in a second. There's a nice man in there. Look at that. And once again, like the eye tracking is just so spot on. Not necessarily eye in this case, so I can't see his eyes, but you know, you know what I mean. Tracking AF. He didn't even notice me. Nice. I thought he did, but then he didn't. That was cool. That was a beautiful scene. Wow. Gorgeous. So, basically, the summary of this camera is that when I had my Z6 and Z7, they were great cameras. I really enjoyed them. I'm not knocking them. I think they're awesome. They're great performing cameras. And if you're thinking about getting one, get one. Don't, don't think, oh my God, you need a Z9, but a Z9 is so expensive. Again, I use this professionally, so I have the, at least I have that excuse, you know? <laughs> but there was always just something about the Z6 that made me kind of long for my D4. I kind of missed it because there was this kind of heftiness to it, right? And this kind of immediate responsiveness that the Z6 doesn't like lack, but you know, I don't know, it just felt a little bit different. This camera though, after using it for so long, has that immediateness, and I would say even more so because of this, as I said earlier, the lack of the physical shutter and it being just purely an electronic shutter mechanism, right? Which means that it's just like, the camera's just like always there. It feels very immediate at all times. Everything is super right on when you need it. And I really love that. And I think that's the main kicker for me about this camera. And why I think, even though I think it, you know, I look like a total bozo using this flagship, you know, giant camera for doing street photography, but that's why I enjoy it. That's why for me it works because I love that immediateness because for street, I think that's extremely important. Let's go down this way, a little passage here. Yeah, I like the little side passages. I feel like that's where we might find something unique and interesting. Cute little restaurant over here. But yeah, from here I guess, yeah, enough about the, the camera. It is what it is. I thought I'd give everyone a little six month impression update kind of thing. Actually, let's go down this little passage here. But um, let's just shoot. That's all, that's, what, that's what's really interesting, right? Is this area, not me blabbing about gear. Oh, excuse me, let's go this way. Yeah, I've shot around here before and had some good, good luck, but tonight it just feels a little different. But again, I think it's because stuff's changing. I think, you know, there's something going away. The Samurai Gallery. Okay, I like this scene here. Let's see what we can do. Oh yeah, that's nice. Just waiting for cool stuff on those signs. That's probably cool enough. And man, the house to my left here is really nice. I've actually shot that before, but it looks really good tonight. Wow. And um, it's just a shame about the cars. I wish the cars weren't there. But you know what? These two particular ones, they kind of work for me. They add something to the scene. Nice. Shooting that right now reminded me of one more little thing 
technical thing about this camera, and I think not only this camera, but just any camera that has a dual ISO, which means like essentially two slightly, or not slightly, but two different ISO modes, I guess. I don't know how to really describe what dual ISO is, but basically most, like, you know, we have all these ISO settings in our cameras, right? Like, you can set, you know, 1,000, 1,600, 3,200, whatever you want. But most cameras really just have one ISO, like a native ISO. Uh, for example, I think on my D4, it was like 400. And the camera actually only shoots at 400 ISO, and then it, you just kind of, like, that's the actual native sensitivity of the, of the physical sensor in there. By the way, if I'm, I might be making this up, so like I'm not an expert on these things, it's just my understanding. So if I'm wrong, please tell me so in the comments. I'm happy to learn something new about this stuff. Let's go this way. But anyway, so it has a, like a native ISO, let's say 400, and then when you change it, you know, in the camera you set say 800, it just adjusts like the signal gain. Like it just boosts the signal or reduces the signal, the same as you would with like audio or something like that. Um, but some cameras, like this one, have dual ISO. So the, the sensor does actually have like two different modes in which it operates, and those two modes have actual different native ISOs. And then it still does the signal boosting thing I just said, but once it goes over a certain ISO, it switches. So this one, up to 400, has one ISO, and then over 400 has another ISO. All that mumbo jumbo really means in practice is that if I'm shooting, let's say, at 320 ISO, so just under that limit, and then later I decide to brighten that photo up and make it, you know, like one stop brighter in post, then what ends up happening is I've, I've gone over, you know, into that second higher ISO zone, but without actually using it, which basically just means that often you get a little more noise that way. So long story short, how that affects my shooting is if I'm shooting like a slow shutter scene like that house I just did, and my ISO is like around 400, and I know I'm, I'm underexposing and I'm going to boost the shadows later because that's intentionally what I'm doing to get, you know, better dynamic range with some bright scenes in the, in, the, in the bright elements in the scene, like the windows in that house. Then I will deliberately just rejigger my settings so that I'm just over 400, 450, 500. Because I know if I push that to 1,000, it's going to look good. Whereas if I'm at 320 and I push it to 1,000, it won't look as good, just from my experience. That's a little... Not like a pet peeve, but just something I gotta be mindful of when I'm using this camera. I think the Z6 had the same thing. The cutoff was 800. But I just kinda, I paid attention to it, but not quite as much, because I feel like 800 is a bit higher. 400 is like a more, I'm more commonly around there. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Or maybe I've just been shooting with mirrorless cameras for two years and I'm just getting more, more wrapping my head around this stuff. And you know, like I said, the D4 didn't have dual ISO. There was just one ISO, so it didn't really matter how I set it doing stuff in post more or less look the same no matter what. Anyway, let's go that way back along the station, see what we can find over there. In the meantime, actually, before just before we cross, I'll shoot this view with all the people going by. Blurry. This used to be a really beautiful view. It's still pretty cool. But they tore down some of the, the bars that were over there on the left side. You can see that empty space. And... Um, Okay, here we go with no people. And it looks worse without it, you know, because there's just this gap over there. Anyway, let's keep going. This place here is really cool and very retro. Some nice retro vibe. I think it's been there for a long time. It's a nice cold night here in Tokyo. It's like, you know, we, we tend to post these videos way after we shoot them because there's a backlog, it takes forever to edit, blah, blah, blah. But well, it's December right now. December 25th, I think. <laughs> Somewhere around there. It's chilly. It's not that cold yet. What else can we shoot here? Over here, this is Koban, which is a little police box, which I'm pretty sure we shot in that Akihabara video at the end. That's where that video more or less ended. Maybe we shoot it again today. Take a look, see what it looks like. Hopefully the cops don't beat me up. You never know. Just 
want me to know people here. Or people being blurry. There's a lot of people going by though. Keep going. You see, again, I flip modes all the time. So I'm, I was, you know, I'm normally on aperture mode, ready to go. But that, that whole scene, there was not a lot of motion there. So I went down. Well, I wanted to go down to a 50th, so I had to switch mode from aperture to M. There's a reason why I like to switch. I could just keep it on M and then change the shutter speed, but I find it faster the other way because I keep the shutter speed on M on a 50th. So I just, with one flip of the dial, I go from a 50th to 250th, which is normally would take a bunch of clicks and then you're, not, you're kind of thinking about you know, hitting that exact speed. Anyway, I like my way, but my way is really, you know, like predicated on the, the ability to use this button here. So I'm very happy about that. Best firmware update ever. <laughs> okay, let's see here. I want to shoot this scene here as well. I love this, like, the glow from this um, lottery ticket sales window thing over here. But I also love just the outside here. This, like, sign with no, you know, this fluorescent light lamps, but there's no actual sign on it. It's a sign with no text. It's kind of cool. And then the flowers in, in the foreground. All right, guys, so we'll end it here, I think. We've done a nice little lap around Kanda Station. We're almost back where we started by that neon sign over there, just up ahead. Um, hope you found it interesting. I feel I got some pretty cool shots, but I always feel that way. Well, not always. Sometimes I feel that they all, they're all, they all suck. <laughs> I don't know. But what my point is, is I have to see them at home. And, but you have already seen them on the screen during the video, so you can make that call yourselves. Anyway, I hope I gave you guys some clear thoughts about this camera. I don't like to focus too much on the gear, but sometimes it pays to talk about it because, of course, you know, it does matter a bit which gear you use. You could use all kinds of gear and still get great photos, but, you know, we do have to, as photographers, make decisions about the technical matters of photography, for better or worse, even though the more fun part is the actual creativity and going out and exploring the city. All right, anyway, we'll end it there. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. And remember always, challenge your eye.